है दस्ते किबला नुमा है दस्ते किबला नुमा ला इलाहा इल्लल्लाह it was in 1913, a year before World War I, when Hazrat Jodi Fateh Muhammad Sayyal ta'ala anhu, arrived in the UK and was able to establish a mission in London under the direct guidance of Hazrat Hakim Mulbi Nuruddin, ta'ala anhu, the first Khalifa of the Promised Messiah and Imam Mahdi, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed of Qadian alayhi salam. The Ahmadiyya Muslim community had very humble beginnings with the first mosque in London, established in 1924. 100 years later, the community is tens of thousands strong and still growing. Ahmadi Muslims are an integral part of British society and contribute in all walks of life. The London Mosque is now among 30 centres in the United Kingdom established by the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, including the Battle of Adul Mosque, the largest mosque in Western Europe. On the 11th of June 2013, a historic reception took place at the Houses of Parliament to celebrate the centenary of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community in the United Kingdom. The world head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community and fifth caliph, Hazrat Mirza Masroor Ahmad, Ayyadahullah Ta'ala bin Asrihil Aziz, was welcomed to the Houses of Parliament by the Deputy Prime Minister and various secretaries of state and parliamentarians. The Palace of Westminster is an iconic building in the City of London. It has been the heart of British politics since the 11th century. It is renowned throughout the world as the Houses of Parliament, as it is the meeting place of the House of Commons and the House of Lords, the two houses of the Parliament of the United Kingdom. Hazul was visiting Westminster to deliver the keynote address at a special reception hosted by Right Honourable Ed Davey MP, the Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change and the all-party parliamentary group for the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. Prior to the event, the three main party leaders had all written in support of the centenary. Whilst congratulating the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, the Prime Minister, Right Honourable David Cameron MP, said Britain could be proud of the community and he praised Hazrat Mirza Masroor Ahmad as a man of peace. Before the commencement of the formal proceedings, Hazrat Mirza Masroor Ahmad held private meetings with the Deputy Prime Minister, Right Honourable Nick Clegg MP. Home Secretary, Right Honourable Theresa May MP, Energy Secretary, Right Honourable Ed Davey MP, Shadow Foreign Secretary, Right Honourable Douglas Alexandra MP, Right Honourable Keith Vaz MP, and Siobhan McDonough MP. The centenary celebrations were attended by 68 dignitaries, including 30 MPs and 12 members of the House of Lords, including six cabinet members and two ministers. Various media organisations, including the BBC, Sky TV, Geo and ITV, were also present to cover the event. Ladies and gentlemen, um, members of the House of Commons, lords and ladies, Your Holiness. It's a real privilege to welcome Your Holiness and the Ahmadiyya community here to the Houses of Parliament to celebrate the centenary of the Ahmadiyya community's presence in the United Kingdom. Uh, those of us who've had the privilege to know the community over many years um, have known the amazing work that Your Holiness does campaigning for peace, that the community does with its charitable works, both in the UK and abroad with your Humanity First charity. And we also know the amazing work that members of the community do in their lives, in business, in society, making a very positive contribution. So it's absolutely fitting 
that all parties in the House of Parliament are represented here at the senior level to celebrate the centenary and to thank you, Your Holiness, for the work that you do and your community does uh, as loyal and uh, hard-working citizens in the United Kingdom. Um, I'm just master ceremonist today, so I will be quiet now. Um, I've got to introduce three people. I'm I slightly changed the order because uh, the Deputy Prime Minister, who is my party leader, has told me he has to go very brief, very shortly. But I know he wants to make some open remarks, and then I'll pass over to Douglas Alexander, Right Honourable Doug Alexander MP, who's uh, representing uh, Right Honourable Ed Miliband today in the uh, Labour Party, and then to Right Honourable Theresa May, representing the Prime Minister. Uh, but Nick, uh, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, welcome to you all, and of course a special uh, welcome uh, to you, um, Your Holiness. It's been a great, great privilege for me to uh, meet you here. I think it's the second time we've met in the last, uh, in the last few years. I know you are a regular uh, visitor and speaker to uh, parliaments and assemblies around the world, whether it's the US Congress or the, or the European Parliament, and I think it is a great honour for all of us from... Uh, all political parties that we should be gathered with you uh, here in the Palace of uh, Westminster to commemorate a very important moment, the establishment of the Ahmadiyya community here in the United Kingdom exactly a hundred uh, years ago. Like everybody here, uh, I have long been an admirer uh, of you and your uh, community for uh, many, many reasons. Uh, your respect for family, respect for the elderly but care for the uh, young is something which I think has always been very uh, evident and striking uh, to me. Your commitment, as Ed said, to charitable works both here at home and abroad. You and I were discussing in our meeting earlier the model villages which the Ahmadiyya community is establishing in, in Ghana, a country you know very well having worked at yourself there, as you explained to me uh, many years ago, is just one uh, further demonstration of uh, your community's willingness to, to act as well as to, uh, as to speak um, the language of, of, of humanitarianism and, and reconciliation. But of course, the most, um, the most important value, ethos, that uh, you teach us and that the Ahmadiyya community has, has steadfastly uh, communicated to millions of people around the world for so long is of course one of peace, one of love and one of um, reconciliation and those are messages which are enduring, are powerful at all times and down all the ages and in all, and in all places and in all communities. Uh, but I, I feel, and I'm sure I speak on behalf of everybody here when I say that those messages of, of peace, of love, of respect uh, towards one another, uh, of reconciliation, these are messages which are especially valuable and serve as a particularly powerful antidote at a time of, of, of tension, of a time where we have seen, uh, unfortunately, incidences of, of, of violence, of brutality and of extremism which, plays, which play no role in any peace-loving um, society. And so I'm sure we join all with you from whatever background we come from, whatever political party, whatever uh, religious um, uh, uh, background we come from, in joining with you in your community, in seeking to both celebrate the presence of your community here over 100 years, but also to celebrate the message that your community has been uh, so quietly, steadfastly, and with great, great dignity um, spreading and communicating for so long, one of peace, one of love, and one of reconciliation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nick. If I could ask right on Douglas Alexander. Um, thank you very much indeed for that introduction, Ed. Can I echo the sentiments that we've just heard from the Deputy Prime Minister on behalf of the British Labour Party and say that we are honoured, Your Holiness, to have you here with us in the Palace of Westminster in the House of Commons today. 
it is not every day that I am asked to speak at a hundredth birthday party, but it is fitting to recognise this, the centenary of the Ahmadiyya community here in the United Kingdom. I would also like to recognise the tremendous and strong links that have been forged with representatives here in Parliament. The work of the all-party group, I think, has been of great value in recent years but also to place on record on behalf of the Labour Party our admiration for that philosophy of reconciliation and peace for which the Ahmadiyya community has come to be known over the last century. Since the establishment of the mosque in Southfields uh, since in 1924, since the establishment of the community here first in 1913, it has been a powerful message communicated with great consistency and candour. Why does it matter today? Because in a world of ever greater diversity and ever greater challenges, that message of reconciliation is needed as never before. And so I would want to place on record our admiration for the leadership that you personally have shown and that collectively the community has shown. So thank you for the work that you have done, the difference that you have made, and the service that you continue to do not simply to members of the Ahmadiyya community, but in being a powerful voice for tolerance, for reconciliation, and for peace. Love for all, hatred for none, is a philosophy from which we can all benefit and for which we have much to learn in the years ahead. Thank you very much indeed. Right on all Theresa May. Thank you very much, Ed. Uh, Your, Highness, Your Holiness, uh, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed a genuine pleasure to be here today to be part of this celebration of 100 years of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community here in Britain. Um, I'm told that when that first individual, the first missionary, arrived in London from India in 1913, he did something which was very British. He started giving speeches at Speaker's Corner uh, in Hyde Park. Um, but I'm also told your community's website records that the speeches weren't perhaps as successful as he might have hoped because a former imam is quoted as saying that people would not listen to him very much. I have to say, Your Holiness, there are politicians in this room who know how that feels. <laughs> but I think few would have predicted that 100 years later there would have been such a flourishing community here in the United Kingdom. And as both Nick Clegg and Douglas Alexander have said, I think what is striking about the community here is not just the message of peaceful coexistence and of peace that you spread, uh, but of the, of the example that you show and the members of the community show in their lives, but also the tremendous work that is done to raise funds for charities, to be part of the local community. Uh, and that is a message that I think we can all take away and uh, would be good for more, perhaps, to abide by your ethos, as Douglas have said, of love for all and hatred for none. I think the way in which you look for ways uh, to ensure that where there is disagreement, uh, that can be worked through by sharing ideas, by discussion, by working together, is an inspiration for us all in terms of our future. It is a message of cooperation rather than conflict. And my goodness me, uh, the world needs a message of cooperation rather than conflict. But we do live in a multi-faith society with different practices, different convictions. And learning uh, for us all to learn to live together does mean learning to tolerance and identifying what unites us rather than what divides us. And there was a very good uh, comment made. I think the point was made very well by... Nazim Butt of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Association after the horrendous murder we saw recently of drummer Lee Rigby in Woolwich. And he said the following, disagreements as we are taught both as subjects of this nation and by the tenets of Islam should be resolved peacefully through dialogue and understanding. It is only through those means that we will be able to promote a harmonious society. Now I know that you have been targeted as a community yourselves um, particularly in Pakistan, where it's a criminal offence for Ahmadis to call themselves Muslims and where you've been subjected to some horrific attacks. There have also been instances of prejudice here in the United Kingdom. Ahmadi businesses have been boycotted, mosques attacked, 
and television channels have broadcast programmes inciting hatred against you. And we have seen generally since Drummer Rigby's murder uh, an increase in attacks directed towards mu Muslim communities of all kinds. Now, I'm absolutely committed to tackling extremism in whatever form it takes. It is utterly unacceptable to threaten and intimidate anyone because of their religious beliefs or because they belong to a particular ethnic group. And I want to stress to you that you have my complete support. The intransigence of the extremists who persecute and intimidate leads only to violence and terrorism. And it cannot and will not be part of Britain so long as we remain an open, tolerant society. And I have no doubt that together we will defeat the extremists. You have shown and continue to show that the only effective way of persuading the extremists out of their poisonous convictions is peaceful dialogue. That is a message that you are giving around the world and it is a message that we should all listen and heed. So we commit to uh, the support for dealing with that extremism, uh, for dealing with that prejudice that sadly so often we see. But I have every confidence that in another hundred years time, uh, there will be a group of people celebrating 200 years of the Ahmadiyya commun Muslim community here in Britain. Thank you for all that you have contributed here in the United Kingdom. But thank you all for what you are doing, not just here in the UK, but your holiness for the message that you are giving to the whole world and the work that your community is doing across the world to bring peace and hope to all people. Well, can I thank all my colleagues, Deputy Prime Minister, the Shadow Foreign Secretary, and the Home Secretary for those words. Uh, I know the Home Secretary has to go to the same meeting that I think uh, the Deputy Prime Minister is at. Uh, and uh, that's uh, the National Security Council. Um, and uh, while I can't tell you what's being discussed there, of course, because it's national security, what I can say is that the work we do on those bodies, the work that we're doing uh, in, this, in this House, uh, is all about trying to deliver peace and security for our world which is a very much a message of the Ahmadiyya uh, community. Uh, and I know one or two other colleague, cabinet colleagues have to go, and I hope one understands that. Um, but, Your Holiness, um, uh, many of us in this room have had the honour to hear you talk before, and can I therefore invite you again to talk to us uh, uh, here in the Houses of Parliament? Should I come there? I close the bundle of papers I can. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. All the distinguished guests, Assalamu Alaikum. Peace and blessing of Allah be upon you all. First of all, I would like to thank those friends of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community who, upon the centenary of our community in the UK, have kindly organized this event within the Houses of Parliament as a means to express their friendship and close relationship with us. I would also like to thank all of those guests who, by attending today, are ensuring that this event proves to be a success and worthwhile. <clears throat> I'm happy that quite a number of you are sitting here and nor are not busy in any of the other commitments or meetings. In response to this gesture, apart from professing my thanks and appreciation, I would also like to say that it is my sincere <coughs> hope and prayer that all of the institutions and people who work within this beautiful and grand building are able to fulfill the rights of serving this country and its people. I also hope and pray that they are able to work in the best possible manner towards 
fostering good relations with other nations to act with justice and so make decisions that are of benefit to all parties. If this spirit is adopted, then it will reap the very best fruits which are of love, affection, and brotherhood, and will lead the world towards becoming a true heaven of peace and prosperity. This desire and prayer of mine is shared by all Ahmadi Muslims because we believe that it is necessary to have a deep love for one's country and for humanity at large. Indeed, Ahmadi Muslims believe that love for one's country is an essential part of faith because the founder of Islam, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, has emphatically ordered and taught this. Thus, let me make it very clear that every Ahmadi Muslim who is a British citizen, whether born here in the UK or whether an immigrant from abroad, is completely loyal to this country and has sincere love for it. They desire only the progress and prosperity of this great nation. The number of the people from other nations who now live in the UK is very significant is and is estimated to be at around 14-15% of the total population of this country. And so I cannot continue without mentioning and praising the great qualities of open-heartedness and tolerance exhibited by the local British people <clears throat> for the way in which they have accepted immigrants as members of the country and allowed them to become part of the fabric of British society. In this sense, it becomes an incumbent moral duty upon those people who have come to settle here to prove themselves to be loyal citizens of this country. And so they must support the government in its efforts to tackle all forms of disorder and strife. As far as the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, community is uh, concerned, its members act upon this principle in whichever country they reside. As you are aware, we are currently celebrating the centenary of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat in the United Kingdom. These past hundred years prove and serve witness to the fact that the members of the Ahmadiyya community have always fulfilled the requirement of being loyal to their country and have always steered absolutely clear of all forms of extremism, rebellion, and disorder. In, in reality, the fundamental reason for this loyal and loving approach is due entirely to the fact that the Ahmadiyya Muslim community is a true Islamic religious community. Our community stands apart as we have continually introduced the true and peaceful teachings of Islam to the people of the world. And we always strive for those true teachings to become accepted as the real Islam. With these few words of introduction, I would now like to turn towards the main theme of my address. Our sect is the standard bearer for peace, reconciliation, 
and harmony, which is why our motto is love for all, hatred for none. Despite the fact that some non-Muslims know us or indeed have close links to us, they are very surprised that the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat attributes its message of peace and brotherhood directly to Islam. The cause of their surprise and shock is because they see that many other so-called Islamic scholars and organizations act and speak in a completely different way and promote a very different message. To explain this difference, let me make it clear that we Ahmadi Muslims believe that in this era, the concept of a violent jihad by the sword is completely wrong and is to be rejected whilst some other Muslim scholars promote it or even practice it. Their beliefs have led to many extremist and terrorist organizations emerging amongst the Muslims in various parts of the world. It is not just groups that are emerging, but we also find that certain individuals are taking advantage of and acting upon these false beliefs. The most recent example of this was, of course, the brutal killing of an innocent British soldier on the streets of London. It was an attack which had absolutely nothing to do with the real teachings of Islam. Rather, Islamic teachings vehemently condemn such acts. Such evil plots demonstrate the clear difference between the true teachings of Islam and the misconstrued teachings which some so-called Muslims are practicing due to their ulterior motives. I would also like to say that the reaction of some of the local groups is also not correct and can destroy the peace of the society. What evidence is there to support our contention that what we believe with regards to Islamic teachings is correct. The underlying point to consider is that the use of the sword or force is only permissible when a religious war is waged against Islam. In today's world, no one, be it a country or a religion, is physically waging war and attacking Islam on the basis of religion. Thus, it is not justifiable in any way for Muslims to attack any other party in the name of religion, because this clearly violates the teachings of the Quran. The Quran only permitted force to be used against those who waged war and raised their sword against Islam. Another crucial point is that if a, if a citizen seeks to inflict any form of, ha of harm on his country or on his fellow countrymen, then clearly he would be doing it against the teachings of Islam. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that whoso sheds the blood of an innocent person is not a Muslim. The Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, has deemed such people as weak in faith and to be sinners. I shall now turn to some other aspects of Islam that prove just how enlightened and pure its teachings really are. I shall explain that the way some so-called Muslim groups present Islam does not represent the real teachings of the religion in any shape or form. It will become clear that their activities are conducted with the sole desire to fulfill their Western interests by falsely using the name of Islam to justify their hate-filled acts. 
Islam puts no, uh, puts so much uh, emphasis on the importance of religious uh, tolerance that it will be impossible to find such high standards anywhere else. Other people tend to believe that until other religions are proven to be false, they are unable to prove the truth of their religion. Islam's approach is very different because it teaches that whilst Islam is a true religion uh, sent for all of mankind, the truth is that all prophets of God were sent to all people and nations of the world. And this is clearly mentioned in the Holy Quran. Allah has said that all prophets were sent by him with teachings of love and affection. And so all true Muslims must accept uh, them. No other religion so willingly and openly praises every faith and every nation as Islam does. Because Muslims believe that prophets were sent to all people and all nations, they cannot ever consider them to be false. Thus, Muslim cannot disrespect, mock, or insult any of the prophets of God, nor can they injure the sentiments of the followers of any religion. Yet, sadly, the attitude of some non-Muslims is the exact opposite. They do not spare any opportunity to, to grievously mock and slander the founder of Islam and so gravely wound the feelings of Muslims. We truly desire religious tolerance and mutual understanding because of the beliefs we hold. Unfortunately, however, when certain elements toy with the feelings of Muslim, it leads to some so-called Muslims uh, reaching to the uh, reacting to the uh, provocation in an entirely wrong and irresponsible way. Their reaction and response has no link to the true teachings of Islam, and you will certainly find that no Ahmadi Muslim, however much they are provoked, will ever react in such a negative manner. Another grave allegation raised against the founder of Islam and the Quran is that they gave teachings of extremism and promoted the use of force to spread the message of Islam. To assess this allegation and to seek the reality, let us look to the Quran itself. Allah the Almighty says, and if thy Lord had enforced his will, surely all who are in the earth would have believed together. Wilt thou then force men to become believers? Chapter 10, verse 100. This verse clearly states that God, as the possessor of all powers, could easily force all people to adopt the same religion. However, he has instead given the people of the world the freedom to choose to believe or to not believe. And so if God has given mankind this freedom of choice, then how could the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, or any of his followers compel or force anyone to become a Muslim? Allah the Almighty also states in the Quran, it is the truth from your Lord. Wherefore, let him who will believe and let him who will disbelieve. Chapter 18, verse 30. This is the reality of Islam. This is the true teaching. If a person's heart desires, then they are free to accept Islam. But if their heart does not, then they are free to reject it. Therefore, Islam is completely against compulsion and extremism. And rather, it advocates peace and harmony at all levels of society. It is quite impossible for Islam to teach violence 
or compulsion because the very meaning of Islam is to live in peace and to provide peace to all others. Nevertheless, when our religious sentiments are taunted, it causes us great pain and anguish. Anything disrespectful said about the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, pierces and wounds our hearts. It was the founder of Islam who developed the love of God and the love uh, his creation of his creation in our hearts. He was, it was he who ingrained and established love and respect for all of mankind and for all religions within us. What bigger proof of Islam's peaceful teachings can there be than the response given by the opponents of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, when he preached and conveyed the message of Islam to them they did not say that by inviting uh, them to join Islam, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, was asking them to perpetrate any cruelties or wrongdoing. Rather, the reply was that if they were to accept the Prophet's teachings, their wealth and status would be threatened or seized by ruthless people because the Holy Prophet peace be upon him, and emphasized only peace and harmony. They admitted to a fear that if they ex uh, accepted Islam, then by adopting peace, the surrounding people, tribes, or even nations would take advantage and destroy them. In short, if Islam advocated violence, and if it called on Muslims to raise their swords and wage war, then clearly the dis disbelievers would not have given this justification. They would not have said that their failure to accept Islam was out of a fear that its teachings of peace could lead to their ruin at the hands of worldly people. The Holy Quran states that one of the attributes of God Almighty is Salam, which means he is the source of peace. It follows that if, if God truly is the source of peace, then his peace should encompass all of his creation and all of mankind, rather than be limited to a specific group of people. If God's peace was only designed to protect some people, then it cannot be said that he is a God for the entire world. Allah the Almighty has answered this point in the Quran, says, if uh, I swear by his repeated cry, O oh my Lord, that these are a people who will not believe, therefore turn aside from them and say, peace and uh, soon shall they know. These words illustrate that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, brought a teaching that was a source of mercy and compassion for all people, and thus was a means of peace for all mankind. The verse also states that in response to the Holy Prophet's message of peace, his opponents did not only reject his teachings, but they ridiculed and insulted him. Indeed, they went even further and opposed him with enmity and created disorder and strife. Upon all of this, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, pleaded to the God that I desire to give them peace, but they do not give me peace. Leaving that aside, they even strive to inflict pain and agony upon me. In response, Allah consoled him by saying, ignore whatever they do and turn away from them. Your only task is to spread and establish peace in the world. You should respond to their hatred and transgression 
by simply saying, peace be with you, and tell them that you have brought peace for them. Thus, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, spent his entire life spreading peace in the world. That was his noble mission. Certainly, there will come a day when the people of the world realize and understand that he did not bring any teachings of extremism. They will realize that all he brought was a message of peace, love, and kindness. Furthermore, if the followers of this noble messenger also respond to cruelties and injustices in the same loving manner, then no doubt those who raise objections against Islam's magnificent teachings will one day become convinced of its truth and beauty. The Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat follows and live by these teachings. It is these teachings of understanding, tolerance, and compassion that we promote and spread to the corner of the world. We follow the historic and unparalleled example of kindness and benevolence that was demonstrated by the Holy Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, when after years of facing the most bitter and horrific cruelty and persecution, he was, abide, uh, he was able to return victoriously to the streets of Mecca. For years, he and his followers were prevented uh, access to even the most basic necessities, such as food and water, and so spent many days at a time suffering in a state of starvation. Many of his followers were attacked and some were killed in the most barbaric and merciless manner one cannot imagine. Even the elderly Muslims, the Muslim women, and the Muslim children were not spared. Rather, they too were treated in a ruthless and brutal way. Yet, when the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, returned to Mecca in victory, he did not seek revenge. Rather, he proclaimed that there shall be no punishment upon any of you, for I have forgiven you all. I am a messenger of love and peace. I have the greatest knowledge of Allah's attributes of being a source of peace. He is the one who gives peace. Thus, I forgive you of all of your past transgressions, and I give you a guarantee of peace and, and security. You are free to min, uh, remain in Mecca and to freely practice your religion. No one will be compelled or forced to in any way. Some of the most staunch believers had fled <coughs> Mecca, uh, disbelievers had fled Mecca in a state of fear of punishment because they knew they had uh, exceeded all limits in their cruelties against Muslims. However, upon witnessing this unrivaled act of compassion and kindness, and this unique display of peace and harmony, the relatives of those disbelievers sent a message to them to return. They were informed that the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, extended nothing but peace and security, and so they did return to Mecca. When they, who were previously Islam's most resolute opponents, saw the uh, saw for themselves the benevolence and mercy of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. They accepted Islam of their own free will. What I have said is part of recorded history. And the majority of non-Muslims, historians, and Orientalists have also certified to its truth. These are the real teachings of Islam. And this, is, this was the noble example of the Holy Prophet, Muhammad, peace be upon him. And so, to label Islam and its founder as violent and to raise such allegations against them is a cruel injustice. There is no doubt that wherever such false allegations are made, we are deeply aggrieved. 
I shall say again that today it is our community, the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat, which is following and living according to the original and peaceful teachings of Islam. And I shall say again that the hate-filled evil acts perpetrated by extremist organizations or individuals have no link whatsoever to the true teachings of Islam. True justice requires that the vested interests of indi individuals or groups should not be attributed to the teachings of a religion. Such acts should not be used an excuse to unfairly level criticism at any religion or its founder. It is an urgent need of the time that in an effort to establish global peace and harmony, all people should display mutual respect for one another and for all religions. The alternatives are horrific. The world has become a global village and so a lack of mutual respect and a failure to, failure to join together to promote peace will not only harm the local area, city or country, but in fact will ultimately lead to the destruction of the entire world. We are all well aware of the horrific devastation caused by the last two world wars due to the acts of certain countries, the signs are that another world war is on the horizon. If a world war breaks out, then the Western world will also be deeply affected by its far-reaching and devastating consequences. Let us save ourselves from such destruction. Let us save our future generation from the miserable and devastating consequences of war. Obviously, the most horrific type of war would be an atomic war, and certainly the way the world is heading, there is a real risk of a nuclear war breaking out. To prevent such a horrific outcome, we should adopt justice, integrity, and honesty, and join together to suppress and stop those groups who wish to spread hatred and who wish to destroy the peace of the world. It is my hope and prayer that God Almighty enables the major powers to discharge their responsibilities and duties in this effort in the most fair and just way. <clears throat> Before uh, concluding, I would like to once again thank all of you for taking the time and effort to attend today. May Allah bless you all. Thank you very much. Your Holiness, thank you very much uh, for those strong words of peace and for explaining the true message of, of Islam to us and putting in the context some of the challenges that the world faces. Um, we have been, uh, one or two of my colleagues have been giving you a few gifts to mark your presence here today uh, with us. Uh, right Honourable Douglas Alexander would like to make a gift and then I will make a final gift on behalf of everybody. But first, uh, Douglas. Um, I believe we have uh, Rep. the Emir of Ghana who would like to come up with a gift. From Ghana, greetings from Ghana. Your Holiness, uh, when you went to uh, America to uh, the Congress, I believe they gave you an American flag. Yes. I know that you already have a, a Union Jack, uh, <laughs> so I want to give you a book on the story of Parliament and this cushion. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think uh, please, according to our tradition, we conclude our uh, formal functions with a silent prayer. So I will offer silent prayer 
everyone can offer their prayer in their own way. Silent prayer. Amen. His message of peace of reconciliation, of love, um, of commitment to community, of respect for the elderly, care for the uh, young, is an incredibly powerful message at all times, but I think is particularly resonant at a time when there uh, are uh, heightened fears in some communities that communities will be set one, and one against uh, each other. And so I'm uh, hugely uh, privileged to be able to welcome him here to the Palace of, Palace of Westminster and strongly uh, support and join in with him in, in seeking to promote a message of peace. Well, I think in any society where there are incidences of violence, of extremism, of prejudice, of hatred, a, a message of, 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 of love, um, a message of, of peace, um, and a message not just of words but of action, also showing what those values mean in practice, doing good works, uh, making commitments to our community both here and in other parts of the world. Uh, His Excellency was telling me about the exceptional work of the Ahmadiyya community of creating model villages in, in Ghana, for instance, where he himself worked uh, many years ago, I think is a, is a very powerful antidote to, uh, to the forces of hatred, division and violence. Well, the message from the Khalifa and from the community, uh, love for all, hatred for none, is a message I hope that uh, communities around the world, countries around the world, leaders around the world could uh, actually follow. Um, and you're right, in my uh, meeting with him we were talking actually also about the situation in Syria and the real worry there where we're seeing uh, huge bloodshed and huge instability and the need for us to, uh, as leaders, do whatever we can to bring peace. And he, in his uh, in critical role, uh, is a real strong voice in the world for peace. Well, I think that the community has contributed a very great deal to the wider life of community here in the United Kingdom uh, and in so many different ways, not just individuals um, going about their daily lives and about their, uh, their business, their contribution to uh, the economy of the, of the United Kingdom, but also the contribution to society and particularly the work that is done with charities, the work that is done to raise funds for uh, local charities and the work that's done reaching out in local communities. I was struck by the remarks he made about the uh, importance of peace in the community and the importance of being part of the wider community and the work that is done within the wider community. And a very clear message, I think, for all of us uh, as to the part that we should be playing. Well, I've seen it in my own constituency where the Amity community are very welcome residents. And I think what they've really done is helped a lot of us to know people of Islam in a very personal way and I think we've seen the the values of peace uh, which frankly are not always the images you get across the media and we've seen those from the Amity people that we've all met in our own constituencies and I really would commend the community for their close engagement with politicians of all parties um, and for what they've done to spread a, a very different message about Islam which I think has been very inspirational. I just think they're extremely friendly and they take great effort to develop good personal relationships Um, and I think that's really impressed everyone they've come across. The community has done more than most in ensuring that they are part of our country and not only has the mosque been a centre of community activity providing religion of course but also education but also they have always been willing to participate in mainstream activity, as can be demonstrated by the large numbers of members of the community who are here. I think it's a great credit to the community leaders, the president and others for what they have done. Well, I think the, the take-home message of his address was very much the, I think the, the core of what the MD community believes in, uh, about the, their faith, 
and their faith, the commitment through their faith to, to love, to, rec to reconciliation and to peace. And also he presented a challenge to those who uh, interpret uh, the, the faith in a different way, which clearly at the moment in the UK is something which, which needs to be challenged. And I am pleased that he has added his voice to those who say that uh, the Islamic faith is one of peace and that those who choose to, to, to interpret it differently are wrong. It's uh, important because I think it's, it's perfectly possible to, uh, first of all, to have a faith, a strong faith, as MDs do, but at the same time to recognise the role that the state uh, has and their commitment to the state. I don't see that there's a, a dilemma there and it's something that is, is perfectly achievable and the MD community are perhaps one of the best uh, possible representations of that. Clearly, above all, um, many of the Ahmadiyya community here in Britain are British and I think that we've got a common set of values. That ethos, love for all, hatred for none that the community has, is precisely the ethos that is the broader one we have here in the UK. And I think that the valuing of our heritage and that, that culture is a really, really important part of what makes uh, Britain tick. But I think it's wonderful that the Ahmadiyya community value that alongside every, all of the values that they brought to the UK. Well, it's a community that's made a huge contribution to British life over the last century, but it's also a community that has been steadfast in its advocacy of tolerance, of love, of understanding and of peace. And I believe that that message of reconciliation, understanding and a commitment to peace is one of the reasons that they're held in such high regard by so many people here in Britain. Well, in the course of his remarks today, His Holiness made clear his commitment to peace and to reconciliation. And I think in circumstances like we will confront in the years ahead, that message of reconciliation has never been more needed. It's one that can bring people together across boundaries of faith and geography, across a whole range of different divisions uh, within and beyond society. So I welcome uh, his very clear statement of support for a view of reconciliation and peace. It's a message that I think many people will admire, recognise and want to see articulated in the years ahead. I think it was a marvellous event. I've just been speaking to His Holiness. I congratulated him on the excellence of his speech. I think it's very, very important that we give the true message of Islam. What's Islam all about? And the message given by His Holiness today is something which I also say, continuously say, and that is we who are here, we have come here from abroad, we must be loyal to United Kingdom, and he mentioned about the fact that when Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he returned to Makkah Sharif, he gave an amnesty to everybody. Everybody was allowed to exist. That is the true message of Islam, forgiveness. And also the fact that Islam does not allow people to be killed in the name of Islam. In my view, some, unfortunately, some of us misunderstand the true message of jihad. And he mentioned earlier on that the only time we should take arms when our religion is being threatened. And our religion is not being threatened at the moment. So why should we commit these awful crimes, like killing of an innocent soldier? And I think it's imperative that Every one of us, doesn't matter, I'm a Muslim leader, but every Muslim in this country must be an ambassador for Islam. And that is giving the true message of Islam. Islam is indeed a religion of peace. And to hear, hear uh, from His Holiness and others, I think, is to be very much appreciated. I'm very happy to have been here. I'm very happy to have joined my friends in the Ahmadiyya community. And I'm particularly moved by the power and strength of this occasion's message from His Holiness. The need for reconciliation, the need for brotherhood, the need for love, the need to stop hating, the need to stop the feeling of revenge. This human quality based on specific words in the Quran, delivered with great strength, is a source of inspiration. And I believe everyone should hear 
and should heed his words. I think the world would be much better if many more people heeded his message, his interpretation, his take. It's so basically grounded on the words of the Quran, on the beliefs of the Prophet.